You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospoya. In this week's program, we interview Borna Ahmad, Bangladeshi secularist and free thinker. We'll also be talking about the horrendous attack on Nice, the coup d'etat in Turkey, an insane fatwa against Pokemon, and a wonderful slice of life about a woman who has survived forced marriages in Afghanistan. Stay with us. In the week that passed, we have come face to face with another horrendous terrorist attack against Nice. It's heartbreaking when you read about all oh, the people who've lost their lives, the children who've lost their lives. And they were just out for a good night, you know, to enjoy the fireworks on Bastille Day. I mean, one of the things that comes up after each of these attacks is, what's the solution? Mm -hmm. And I think partly, you know, a big part of the solution is dealing with Islamism as a whole and not just with jihadism. I agree. Um, I mean, as you said, a lot of people are looking for, looking for a solution uh, in these circumstances. Unrelenting sort of uh, uh, massacre of innocent people everywhere. In Europe, in Middle East, North Africa, you'll see this happening uh, on, on daily basis, effectively. And solution is to look at the whole Islam as a political movement, political Islamist movement, Follow, following every uh, incident of, incidents of this nature and terrorist attack. You'll see that a, a lot of people who come in and say, "This is nothing to do with Islam." On the other hand, the right wing start attacking the immigrants. You know, to attack immigrants is just. It's wrong, morally wrong, and also misplaces the whole issue. Mm. It is a political Islamic movement. Yeah. And you know, we need to target Islamism the, full the, force. They are in power, yeah. and they are vying for power. And that's what we need to tackle and recognize. It's a whole movement that needs to be looked yeah. at. And let's now move also to uh, the coup d'etat in Turkey. Uh, well, obviously, you know, it's it's been a uh, opportunity now for Erdogan to just arrest thousands upon thousands of people threaten uh, you know uh, people uh, who were involved in the coup d'etat or who he suspects were involved They're just you know yeah. he's obviously using it as an excuse to silence anyone who is in opposition to him uh, and uh, there's talk about bringing back the death penalty I mean after these political incidents who's benefiting from it is quite important and clearly Erdogan is benefiting from this and he's uh, orchestrating uh, you know the pushback he is arresting a lot of judges who were uh, uh, did disagree with him. Uh, he's cleansing the um, the army, um, uh, as far as his supporters are concerned, um, and he wants to bring death penalty back. I mean, that, the, people, the, the world needs to resist against uh, uh, Erdogan's reactionary response to this situation. And people of the world really needs to support uh, um, civilization in yeah, Turkey. Yeah, it's not enough for governments to say, "Well, we're behind the elected uh, government of Turkey." Human rights violations cannot be allowed, no matter what the excuse or justification. Uh, it's as simple as that. At the Reason Rally in Washington, D.C. last month, I was able to interview the wonderful Bona Ahmad, and I'd like you to listen to this interview, it's, uh, a lot of it is very personal and it's, uh, uh, much of it is the first time she's ever talked about some of these very personal issues about her work, her uh, secularist activities uh, in Bangladesh for free thought as well as that of uh, Avijit Roy. Stay with us. Bon Ahmed, it is a great pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to ask you what you were doing here in Washington DC at the Reason Rally just uh, recently. Oh, um, thank you very much. Um, it's so nice to meet you, Mariam. Uh, let me thank you first. And uh, we have missed each other so many times. And, you know, what a loving, great person you are uh, behind that feisty Mariam Namazi. Oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, thanks. Now you're making me blush. Oh, no, you are. <laughs> and see, you blush, too. That's so nice to see you. There you go. Um, so um, 
it looks like, um, and, and we all know, uh, the awareness about the rest of the world is much higher in Europe. Um, though Avijit and I both were American citizens, um, you know, the American humanist organizations are just catching up with this, what's, hap with what's happening in Bangladesh recently. So um, I've been all over in Europe, but um, the, the, this is the first time actually the American Humanist uh, Association and also Reason Riley invited me. I was at the uh, American Humanist Association's uh, annual convention last week uh, delivering a speech there, and uh, I was invited here for uh, delivering the keynote speech yesterday at the end, uh, at the closing of the Reason Rally. It was so nice uh, to be here to see that there are so many other people you know in 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 such a cons america is known to be a very conservative country so you know it's 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 very nice to see you know so many people coming out to to the mall uh to show the you know unity and that we all exist and that our voice also matter so yeah definitely and uh what was uh, the sort of message that you were trying to get out to Americans in this country? <laughs> um, so there are a few things. Um, I am actually struggling with this because uh, first, you know, um, I have to introduce myself. Uh, our work was mainly concentrating in, on Bang Bangladesh, in Bangla-speaking uh, community, uh, writing books, uh, blogs, uh, though uh, we did write some uh, English, some in English uh, before too. So, you know, I have a pretty complicated job uh, to like um, introduce us, introduce Avijit, introduce our work. Uh, and on top of it, you have to introduce Bangladesh too, because, uh, you know, it, it, it's very few people really know about Bangladesh um, other than most probably hearing um, bad news, um, like, uh, you know, something happened with the garments workers or cyclone or flooding. Uh, and I am so sorry that I am uh, bringing in another bad news that what's happening in Bangladesh. But um, so that's one part of the noise, um, of, the, of the message um, uh, I, uh, I want to bring awareness to what's happening not only in Bangladesh but many parts of the world uh, yeah, today and also at the same time my message yesterday I think half of my keynote speech yesterday was that I do not see religion just as um, as religion you know it's uh, this is what I tried to say yesterday that uh, you know religion is just one part of the puzzle it's a big puzzle unless we actually um, relate religion you know there's one part there there is a social cultural anthropological aspect of religion but also I think uh, religion is the religion today because the political um, powers actually use this as a weapon and uh, if we do not understand the global politics around it how religion is being used all over the world um, you know, what is happening since you know first world war second world war um, I in many sense I feel that we are seeing the aftermath of the decisions we have made collectively, you know, um, uh, uh, for hundred or more than hundred years since uh, the colonial world um, ended and then the, this new imperialistic world uh, started with, you know, the Cold War, the superpowers, um, uh, the oil, yeah, you know, the economic decisions we are making based on, you know, getting the uh, control over the world resources and world markets. So to me, um, it's, it's a very political issue. I was very glad to see that Liz, uh, you know, on CNN, uh, Liz says, we are going to go political, you know, in the Reason Rally. And I think you cannot really separate uh, these things anymore. Um, as humanist, if you are really claiming yourself to be a humanist, that you 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 read, you want to know, you, you want to get the, have the knowledge, um, uh, you, you want to see the people from uh, the world from scientific perspective, um, with reason and understanding and knowledge, then you should be able to get a bigger picture. 
um, and also uh, just saying that religion is the only problem. It is a problem. I'm not saying it's not a problem. It is a problem, but also if we don't connect them, uh, we say the part of the story. So that's the message that I would like, um, you know, to give. Um, and that's that. I, I, I myself also want to do work on that, um, do some research work on that. One of the things about you is that, I mean, uh, the, the minute I saw you, and I think the minute anyone sees you for five minutes or so, you're immediately seen as someone very strong and also <laughs> someone who's a bit of a troublemaker. That's what <laughs> one of the security guards was saying yeah, about you. Yeah. And you asked, how did you know that? Because you've only seen me. I just give the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you perceive yourself? <laughs> oh my gosh, Avijit would have had so much fun with this. Uh, especially, you know, my friend Snigda was here. We have been friends for 30 years, you know, since since the third grade. And uh, they, they would, I think, they would love to answer that question. <laughs> I wish Avijit was here. Like with that wit and sarcasm and that face and that, oh my gosh, I'd be crushed by now. Um, <laughs> How do I see myself? Do you see yourself as a troublemaker and someone who's strong and feisty? Oh my gosh. Um, I, would, I would like to identify myself as strong, uh, but you know, this is, this is strange. Uh, people, there, there are a few conceptions about strong women in our society, right? Uh, or women as a whole. Uh, like if you're a woman, you are mourning, you are sad, you are supposed to cry, you are supposed to have tears. Um, but, but you know, uh, why would I have tears in front of hundreds of people? I am not victimizing myself. I am not asking for sympathy. You know, you can stand with me, you can stand by me, but I am not asking for sympathy. Um, but at the deep down, uh, you know, this is what I said actually at the BHA, that I am not claiming that by, um, by denying supernatural power, I have become a superwoman, you know, that I don't cry, I am not sad, I cry a lot, I have my insecurities, I have my fear, I have my limitations, you know, and, and I think that makes us a human, human being. Um, uh, strong women do not have to be, uh, you know, something beyond a human being. Uh, we can be strong and we can be a normal human being and a woman. You know, I think I I would identify myself as a hundred percent woman. Uh, I am proud of it. Um, we don't need to, you know, go back to that version of feminism when you needed to be a man to be strong. Uh, you know, a woman can be a woman and can be very strong and can be equal. Uh, to a man. So, sorry, I just went on a no, rant. Crazy. But, um, <laughs> and about troublemaking, I don't know. I, I normally do um, what I like to do. Um, I have said this in the past that I don't like, um, you know, family, society, state, you know. Uh, to define me, to limit me. I think I do have the courage to do what I want to do, what I like to do. And if that's called troublemaking, <laughs> so be it, you know? <laughs> I mean, given all the things that you have gone through, uh, you know, and uh, I just wonder sometimes how you manage to keep your sanity. Uh, you, you are going to ask me all the hard questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so much easier to answer the other, you know, the, the questions about, you know, what happened and other things. These are actually very hard questions. Um, um, I don't know if I'm sane yet. Um, I do fall um, every few months. Uh, I have these aftershocks. I keep telling myself that I can go without, I, 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 I'm okay, you know, I'm not gonna have these anymore, but um, 
I just, I just uh, fall. Maybe you know, I have to convince myself one day that uh, that uh, an earthquake this big will have massive aftershocks. Um, there are a few things. Um, my psychiatrist actually laughs at me. Uh, sh I have a few counselors and psychiatrists. Um, they think um, it's okay that I keep myself um, insanely busy, um, but um, I do have to stop at a point and, and uh, uh, give myself some time to heal. That's one thing. Another thing I really try to do is uh, stay away <laughs> from the online world. There's so much noise, so much, you know, backbiting, and I think that's such a waste of time. Um, I, I, uh, some people do complain that I am too, I, um, you know, don't promote the cause enough. I'm not, but to me um, I think it will drive me crazy if I am out there uh, debating um, uh, looking at what people say uh, and uh, you know everything people say about me or about everything else and uh, because then you'll have urge to go and uh, fight it right um, I try I have told everybody do not even tell me when people uh, say bad things about me do not even tell me. I don't want to know. If I don't know, I will not have the, you know, the feeling or that urge to, to reply to it. Um, I don't, you will not believe it, I do not go to the news feed in Facebook. I put out things that I think is necessary, which is not personal at all. And um, I, I think I can get my news from somewhere else. Um, you know, there are other sources that I can get my news from. So I guess that's it, and um, lots of reading. I have tried many different things to calm myself down, but uh, nothing else works. Nothing else works. Um, uh, if you call it meditation, you call it you know calming down, you call it anything. Um, reading is the only thing that actually gives me sanity. What do you think about um, this thing of uh, always, uh, very often, always being introduced as Avijit's wife or widow? Uh, <laughs> when you're obviously such a strong person in your own right, you wrote uh, and very, you were instrumental in Muktamuna as well. You've written your own book and you know so on and so forth. And obviously, the respect Avijit also had for you um, and and your strength. How does that sometimes make you feel having that sort of um, label? Um, you know. Y uh, as long as I am identified as an independent person, as Avijit used to adore about me, he has written about it in many places, that what he likes the most about me is, is me being an independent, strong person. Um, I used to get mad at him every time he said, oh, I don't have to think about you, you can take care of yourself. Um, but that's a different story. Um, it's, um, I, don't, I don't mind um, if people show me as, as a person, uh, they identify me as an individual, and then they say, I am a Vijit's widow. You know, I, I'm pretty happy to be associated with a Vijit, but that's not my only identity. Tell us a bit about uh, Avijit's uh, personality, because you have mentioned that he's goofy, he was goofy, and uh, <laughs> his really close relationship with your daughter. Yes, yes. Um, um, where do I even start? You know, he was, I, every time I think what I had for last 13 years, you know, is it, it makes me tear up. Uh, I, I don't want to say he was a superhuman, you know, I don't want to put him on a pedestal. Um, I don't want to make him a god. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do. Um, I, I would say we had our fair share of problems in a relationship, you know, in our romantic um, uh, relationship. Uh, but 
he was a wonderful person that's one thing i have to give you the persona he had on internet is so different than the person he was he's quiet you know nobody would believe it the way he used to write the force he had in his writing he would sit in a big place you know with many people and just stay quiet and i would just go you know i would just talk and he would sometimes say you know um talk less <laughs> Seriously, you told me that. <laughs> and and um, uh, one thing I have learned from him is having a big heart. So know how to forgive people. You know, I think he he has such a big heart. He met Trisha when she was six. Um, I remember he's so quiet and he's pretty like you know a, a, a very good friend of ours uh, Roger she used to say he doesn't talk much because he's lazy I think he thinks you know if he talks then he has to put some effort to it then he will not think so that's why he doesn't talk but um, so in the beginning I remember I, I, I was like one day I said you should put some more effort to get close to Trisha and she he said let me do it my way you know this will happen naturally Look at the confidence, you know, and Trisha, that's the da dad she knows. Um, I think sometimes I think she's having a harder time than even I am. Um, uh, we moved into a new place this weekend, uh, last weekend, and uh, she sits on the sofa and first thing she tears up and she goes, you know, it's reminding me of dad and I'm thinking so many times after school after four o'clock I would fall asleep on this sofa and dad would come in open the door and go hello you know that's what he used to say and every time I lie down on this sofa I think about him you know two weeks after I was still in the ICU Trisha goes mom you have to learn to be dad and you at the same time I come to you when I need help uh, but I went to dad when I needed someone to just listen I when someone will not give me a solution I just listen to me so you know so many times she would come back from school and she would like, like she would just keep talking and we have to hear all about her boy problems all of her other problems and I'm like please Trisha leave me alone you know I just came back from work I I can't do this and I have problem with do I talk so much I have problem with noise and a lot of problem I guess I'm very narcissistic I, I will talk so anyway uh, so what she would do, we would have these discussions at dinner table. It's very goofy, you know. They would poke on each other. I was the only adult there. And they were like, loosen up, come on. You know, this is just, we're here for a few years. We'll be gone. What the heck? Why are you so uptight? Um, let's have fun. That's how she, they were, both of them. And then they would just, um, after doing the dishwasher and all that, they would just walk out. They will walk outside of the neighborhood uh, so that Trisha can just talk. He will listen. Uh, so she would call him every time she needed to talk about a boy, <laughs> about her uh, emotional issues, about, you know, those kind of uh, teenager things. So he was such a big influence on her. Um, you know, you have to stop me because if I start talking about my 13 years with Avijit, it will be hard for me to stop. But um, I have to tell you that he, he, he taught me how to be, how to have a big heart and how to calm down and see the world in a bigger perspective. As a final question about coping, you know, people will say sometimes when they have this sort of tragedy in their lives, they might turn to God. <laughs> yes. Obviously, that hasn't happened to you. No. But how do you cope? Um, that's funny. I wrote about it, actually. Um, every time I get into a situation, I have never been to a situation like this, comparable to this one. But this is what I did um, in the ICU. I thought, you know, this is a random universe, you know, we are here by chance. Um, 
there is nothing, there is no design, there is nothing which is looking over me. Uh, so, uh, so I looked at the, I calculated the probability of happening this to someone. I literally did. I thought about this, you know, look at these, like at that time, the ISIS was taking all the Yazidi girls as sex slaves, you know, in last year, March, April. And I, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, you know, um, if that can happen to that girl who has no way out, who has no other platform, she has to live as a sex slave to these people for the rest of her life. She doesn't know when, when or ever she will get out. She has to be braver than me. If it can happen to millions of people, it can happen to hundreds of thousands of Syrians, Yazidis, the sex slaves, uh, the sex trafficked, you know, trafficked women all over the world, uh, men, you know, um, um, it's, it's the, the amount of indiscrimination, violence, poverty all over the world, um, it can also happen to me. Um, I don't ask the question, um, what was my sin? sin? Why me? You know, I have seen people going nuts over thinking, why me? Why was I punished? I don't have that question. I think that is a very big thing. I think that keeps me sane, that because I never think, why me? Why, were, why you know, God, why were you so mean to me? What did I do? Was there something wrong that I did? I'm getting punished for how my afterlife is going to be. I have none of those questions. And when I look at this random world and all the things going on, um, first thing I feel is it can happen to me as well. Uh, millions of people coped with it, um, are coping with it, and I should be able to do that as well. Um, you know, um, it's hard. I break down. I have my moments, but uh, that gives me strength. Thank you, you wonderful, lovely woman. Oh, no, thank you so much, Mariam. I hope you enjoyed that interview with the wonderful Bon Ahmad. I mean, for me, I think when I look at Bon Ahmad, I see a, a formidable woman who has given up so much for the fight for free thinking, for rationalism, for secularism. I think, you know, we all have a responsibility to support her and people like her. And I think um, we know, and it's an unrecognized fact, really, that in Middle East, North Africa, Asia, there is huge and huge secularist movement, free thinking movement, and a lot of people are resisting religious uh, reactionary movements. Their voice needs to be heard, recognized, and their leadership needs to be, you know, recognized and appreciated. They are at the forefront of uh, resisting and defending, resisting Islamism and religious reactionary movements and defending free thinking. And that's such an important movement that we need to defend. This week's Insane Fatwa is from Saudi Arabia and it is from uh, the most important Can I guess? higher, 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 very high committee for scientific research and Islamic law because of course That's a fatwa machine. the two are, you know, they go hand in hand with each other. Science and religion and, and fatwa, all perfect. of them are just, just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and of course Saudi Arabia has to be their center. And guess who's leading this institution? Hmm. Our friend, our friend, Abdul Aziz Ben oh. Abdul Aziz Ben Sheikh. <laughs> Abdul Aziz Ben Abdullah Al Sheikh. He's got the same name a couple of times. Just He's very famous in sort of generating fatwa <laughs> on minute by minute basis. Making his yes. name longer and longer by just so, repeating it. Yes. <laughs> so basically, he said that the Pokemon is un-Islamic, and he has said that it's also promoting Zionism. It is. Oh, that that's automatic with, with Islamists, anti-Semitism, and Zion. You know, and the Zionism is just yeah. attached automatically. Yeah. yeah. But his main sort of concern is 
that is creating imaginary friends for people. Mm, and we know we can only have the one irony imaginary my, friend. The yes, irony, yes, yeah. the irony of it. It's amazing that he doesn't like imaginary friends. So I wonder. Stay away. Uh, scientific research has been done on this. Stay for, uh, stay I mean, away. my advice is to stay away from imaginary friends. Our slice of life this week is from a woman called Zahra Yegane. She was married off as a child and she's written a book uh, called The Light of Ashes, which has become a bestseller in Afghanistan. And it is about her, you know, the violence that she faced as a child when she had her first night uh, with her husband. You know, her husband, she was just uh, a young girl, she ended up waking up in the hospital the next day and she talks about the pain and the suffering of, of so many women and girls of Afghanistan. And, and the beauty of this book is about actually reflects a lot of everybody's sort of experience in Africa, mm -hmm. a lot of women's uh, experience in Afghanistan and uh, all men, young men are reading this and sort of affecting their behavior as well. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, everybody wants to read this book. It's a beautiful uh, uh, book, and uh, and it's everything. a it's a book about you know the human spirit and triumphing over the worst possible situation. You know, she now lives with her two other kids. She lost one of her children uh, again uh, because of the uh, because she was so young when she gave uh, birth the first time. And uh, you know, she's someone who's now well known. She's an author, a best-selling author. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful book, and we recommend that everybody uh, uh, read yes. it. Read the book. We hope you've enjoyed this week's program, and until next week, we'll see you again at the same time and same place. Goodbye. Goodbye. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.